I'm Craig Stewart. I'm the executive director of the Indiana University Pervasive Technology Institute and associate dean for research technologies. Uh, I'm talking this afternoon about a novel partnership between Indiana University and Penguin Computing, and I'll be presenting along with Matthew Jacobs of Penguin, Barbara Halleck, Rich Nepper, uh, and Bill Barnett. And this talk is interesting to you if you are in a position where you want to or need to or are in a position to turn money into computing time and allocation uh, priority. So this Penguin cluster system that we'll be talking about is an on-demand, cluster on-demand resource available to anyone at a .edu or an FFRDC, Federally Funded Research and, De and, and Development Center, in the US. And we are particularly interested in offering services to uh, university researchers who are in a time bind, have to get more computing done in a shorter period of days than their local resources allow, or if, uh, if someone has, say, a startup allocation, uh, they're thinking about maybe buying a cluster to put in their own lab, uh, the Penguin Computing Partnership allows an opportunity for people to convert that sort of startup money into computer time on a superb and advanced computing cluster uh, without having to buy computer hardware, having to run their own computer hardware, uh, and then be stuck with looking at a four-year-old cluster sitting in the corner uh, of their lab at some point in the future. So uh, with no further ado, I'm going to talk a little bit about the background, uh, cyber infrastructure in the US, uh, needs for cyber infrastructure, and why this penguin computing relationship is a novel idea that allows universities to have the convenience of cloud computing, the performance of cluster computing, and retain full rights to your own data and control over your own future and your resources with computing. I'm going to begin with a little bit of background information about the structure of cyber infrastructure in the US. This diagram here shows uh, the aggregate capacity in teraflops, that's trillions of floating point operations per second, in a number of different types of computing resources that are available to the US research community in the US. The NSF Track 1 system, uh, 10 petaflops, uh, 10,000 teraflops, located at NCSA in Champaign-Urbana, Champaign Illinois, the Blue Water Systems, uh, Track 2 facilities, campus systems. Uh, if you put together all of the workstations at all of the Carnegie Research universities in the US, you get, a, you get about 6,000 teraflops, about six petaflops. Volunteer computing, the various at-home, sort of BOINC-based volunteer computing systems, that's more computing power aggregate in the US available to researchers than the NCSA Track 1 Blue Water System. Uh, and commercial clouds, uh, at the time the slide was made, uh, March of 2011, uh, somewhere between 8 and 10 petaflops. So a lot of computing capacity available in the US to US researchers. Very, very interesting, complex structure because there are a lot of different types of computing facilities in different places that have different performance characteristics and different means of access. With all this computing, though, it's still the case that there isn't enough computing resources available to the US research community to meet researcher needs. Uh, this diagram here shows a slide, uh, a survey of NSF-funded principal investigators, people who you think of as being the best and best-funded researchers in the US. Uh, we asked a very simple question. Do you have enough cyber infrastructure resources to do your research? 10% said never. 20% uh, said only some of the time, 40% said most of the time. Only 30% of a random sample of people who were funded as principal investigators by the National Science Foundation said they always had enough cyber infrastructure. So we're looking at the best of the best here, and most of those people don't have enough access to cyber infrastructure resources. What that means is that the community as a whole certainly doesn't have enough resources, and more resources are needed. Cloud resources uh, certainly seem like 
one of the options for supporting research. I mean, clouds look nice and serene. Thanks to NIST, we've got a nice definition of what cloud computing is. Uh, in particular, the concepts behind cloud computing in general are on-demand access, uh, flexible capacity in the resources you're using, uh, usually some sort of pay-for-play uh, kind of arrangement that you get to over long-haul networks. Um, and you hear about them all the time. Uh, you hear people saying, well, cloud computing are just the solution to every problem we have. But are they really? First of all, where are your data? Uh, are they in the U.S.? Are they outside the U.S.? What are the physical and legal and network security arrangements around your data, wherever they may be? Uh, did you actually read the license terms? Uh, so when you put uh, your data on one major cloud provider, this is the license that you agree to by virtue of using that service. When you upload or otherwise submit content to our services, you provide a worldwide license to use, host, host store, reproduce, modify, create derivative works. That's what you're giving the cloud provider in the act of putting your data on the cloud. And there are lots of data where that's perfectly fine. You know, some company wants to distribute worldwide a picture of me running through a trail in the woods in some race sometime. Have at it. There are lots of types of data that are completely insensitive, and, and this sort of license is no problem at all. But, you know, that's not all data. If you're doing research where you're developing uh, some sort of novel drug, you're develop developing intellectual property that you consider uh, valuable, you're developing intellectual property for a university or a community, uh, a, a, a university or a company that does not allow you to give away rights, and all of a sudden, by the act of putting your data on somebody else's computer, you have done just that. Uh, so there are a lot of things simply around the policies, procedures, legalities of cloud services. And then the question is, you know, how secure is the cloud provider financially? Some of these companies are very, very large. We have seen banks that were thought to be too large to possibly fail go under in a matter of days. Uh, there have been cases where small hosting facilities went under, hosting facility went dark, um, bank took over the property and unplugged the electricity, locked the doors, uh, company having servers sitting in that hosting facility all of a sudden can't get to their own servers, can't get to their own data. Uh, and then there's the performance issue. So if you're doing parallel computing, if you're doing high performance computing, uh, Cloud uh, services may not be uh, the right type of facility to get you the best uh, results in doing your scientific research. Above campus services are a type of aggregate services, not exactly clouds, <clears throat> a concept developed by Shell Wagner and Brad Wheeler, uh, not exactly clouds, but an idea of universities trying to work together to create aggregated and flexible services that live above the level of individual campuses, achieve the economy of scale, achieve the flexibility that you get out of a cloud provider, but retain more ownership, more control, more autonomy for the universities that are participating in these sorts of arrangements. And Internet, too, now has a suite of services like that that they label their Net Plus services. And we actually have a service that we are delivering in partnership with Penguin Computing, which is one of our uh, new initiatives to provide the same sort of uh, opportunity. Economy of scale, flexibility, uh, above the level of an individual uh, university campus, uh, but still maintaining control. And with no further ado, I will turn the podium over to Barbara Halleck. So uh, as mentioned, I'm Barb. Uh, I am the senior systems analyst uh, specializing in support for com penguin computing at IU. Uh, what this means is uh, that I sort of provide an interface between other universities or anybody at a you know, federally funded research and development center 
who would like to buy time on the Penguin cluster. Um, the, the, the actual process, um, if you're wanting to pay with a credit card, is very simple. Um, you don't even need to get in touch with me. The, the, the process is literally you go to that address, you fill out your form and, and, and register your credit card. And if you're not the first person in your university, you're pretty much available, I think, within 10 to 15 minutes to, to go computing. And if you are the first person, um, I believe what I was told is it's usually within a day. Uh, so there is a little bit of, of time while we, we set up an organization first, but it's pretty quick turnaround. Uh, now that said, uh, obviously your credit card is not going to be a great option for many academic centers. Um, and so we are working now with Penguin to develop a process to handle open payment orders as well. So that is coming up, but not here yet. Um, in the meantime, if somebody were to want to work with an open payment order, you could get in touch with me and I could put you in touch with Penguin. Um, so Penguin's got a great deal of experience with, with this type of, of hosting, uh, currently including uh, Life Technologies Bioscope and LifeScope in the cloud. Um, the, the benefit here of, of the Penguin On Demand cluster is that it is right there in the IU data center, um, you know, protected from all kinds of crazy tornadoes and power outages. Um, and IU is making sure that those data are secure um, to federal, federal requirement or state requirements in Indiana. And so you know that the, the requirements for your data are, are based on the state where they live. And since you know where they are, you can figure those, those requirements out, which is not necessarily so easy when you're using Google or Amazon. Um, the, here are the specifications for, for Rockhopper. Um, it is 4.4 teraflops with a clock speed of 2.1 gigahertz. Um, 128 gigs per node with um, 1408, 1408. Well, anyway, it's the the, st the statistics are um, you can read. So I will just um, say that the. the this is a pretty decent, I mean, this is not up to the scale of that, that tier one NCSA equipment that we saw. Uh, this would be something for people with smaller needs than, than somebody who needed 10 or 13 teraflops. Um, some of the applications that we have available include um, atmosphere prediction, uh, quantum molecular chemistry, uh, data intensive biomedical research, uh, molecular dynamics um, and and uh, like uh, protein sequencing uh, is another one um, and and so there's a wide variety and and penguin I know from experience has been really good with working with us to get new program new packages uh, implemented when people need them so that has also been a really great experience um, here's another list of some more programs that we've got. Uh, here we see Open Atom, which is molecular dynamics again. Um, some compilers and weather research and forecasting. Um, so there's some really exciting stuff that you can do with the Penguin system. And, uh, and I think that's really great. Um, so here's a little more about Penguin On Demand. Um, so POD is an on-demand HPC system, which means that you use, you pay for what you use, and, and that's it. Um, uh, cost is billed by, by um, the gigabyte month for storage and by the core hour for compute time. Um, and you can, you can run out more, one or more cores depending on your needs, and, and you know, running out more cores may help. Um, their, their HPC support, is, is incredible. I will say that I, I've seen a lot of discussion among people using Penguin services. Um, their, their support people have helped uh, efficient, uh, optimize code for efficiency. Um, and, and so, so they, they really know what they're doing. They, 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 uh, one particular customer really noted a, a serious increase in, in, or a decrease in the number of core hours that they were needing for a job after, after consulting with Penguin. Um, and they also offer product design and managed services, 
all of that stuff. So, so there's a, a wide variety of stuff that you can get with the Penguin On Demand cluster. So the cloud management system uh, allows for uh, these capabilities, um, which are sort of your basic f core functionalities that you might need to, you, you might need to implement a, a cloud type cluster, um, including HTML5 based cluster management tools. So they're right on the cutting edge there, um, and they they do work with you know scheduling and migration, and, and they're they're very hands on and helpful. Um, we have run 12 million commercial jobs in counting. Or they have, excuse me, um, their current data centers. Uh, there's one in Salt Lake City, one in Indiana University right here at the data center uh, in Bloomington, and one in Mountain View, California. Um, total of 1,500 cores, both AMD and Intel, and 240 terabytes of on-demand storage. Uh, and these are a few of the companies that partner with cloud, uh, with Penguin Com Computing for cloud services, uh, including Caltech, ESI, and Earthmine. Then here is the pod advantage, just to sort of sum up what I've said in the past few minutes. Um, the big thing is that it's persistent. Um, it's not going anywhere. Uh, IU is unlikely to go bankrupt and have the bank repossess the, the data center anytime soon. Um, our compute nodes, uh, their, their compute nodes are high speed and they are physical, not virtual. So you're getting an actual machine and not just a VM. Um, the, the storage, um, the, the local storage um, means fast access. Um, there are, you know, your standard security protocols that you would see. Um, and the billing, as I said, was by the fractional core hour um, or the gigabyte months, depending on your, on your usage. Um, and, uh, the, the big advantage for me is, is that the HPC expertise of, that we're getting from the partnership with Penguin, uh, because as a person who's coming in uh, and, and just learning Penguin on demand as, as we're rolling it out, I have had a lot of help from their support and they have been just really wonderful. So, and, and they're troubleshooting and they, they do troubleshoot. So, so that's really great as well for frustrated users. <laughs> And uh, they are highly dependable. And uh, now I'm going to turn it over to Rich Nepper, who is going to talk about campus bridging. Thanks, Barbara. Uh, I'm Rich Nepper. I'm the manager for campus bridging and research infrastructure at Indiana University. Um, just talk a little bit about how POD relates to our campus bridging uh, efforts. Campus bridging is, is really an initiative designed to bring resources closer to, to researchers. The, the idea is that a lot of research, researchers, as, as Craig had mentioned, have problems getting enough resources to carry out their analysis, either when they want to or as quickly as they want to. Um, and the other, the other sort of barrier is that the resources that are available when, when people go to use them, they, they need to scale up from their lab or from their workstation resources and making the transition from a system that, that they understand and work with every day to a system like the Exceed systems, the National Research, Resource Centers. Um, it, it's a very, very big gap when you get your account and, and log on. So you, you know, you, you're promised these, these great resources and lots of capacity and you go and get an account and you fill out all this paperwork and you log on to the system the first time and it's nothing like a system that you've used before. It's, it's very difficult to, to sort of ramp up the knowledge to, to be able to use that if that's, if that's something that's not really your core competency. So the goal of campus bridging is to make that transition easier. And there's, there's two sort of directions. One is to make Exceed more familiar to, to researchers who may be using it for the first time. And the other thing is, is to be able to propagate some of the practices that are in place in large-scale national resources down to where they can be implemented at a local level. So to sort of smooth the transition in each direction for scaling research up into larger and larger machines. Now there's a lot of more information at the PTI website on the campus bridging pages about the initiatives. There's been a national task force. Um, but 
Penguin, the, the Penguin Computing Initiative in particular allows us to support um, both the Exceed environment and the National Center for Genome Analysis support. So I'll start talking uh, a little bit about how Exceed works. Uh, for those of you who are, aren't familiar with Exceed, uh, Exceed is essentially sort of wrapped up in, in multiple things. So it's a project, uh, and it's an institution, and it's a set of services. It, you, you, can, you can look at it from a number of different angles. Um, Project-wise, Exceed is, is a, a $121 million, $121 million grant to the National Center for Super, Supercomputing Applications. Uh, they manage the Exceed environment and the Exceed resources. Um, it's the successor to the TerraGrid project for providing large-scale national resources. Um, it, NCSA heads up the institution. Uh, they, they sort of work with 18 other partner organizations that provide expertise. They provide um, also uh, resources to the environment that's, that's spread all around the U.S. And a lot of these are former Terragrid institutions, and some of them are new institutions. Um, and part of, the, part of the transition from Terragrid to Exceed is that a lot of formalization has happened so that software is formalized. Um, the, the, the idea is that services are, are common to all of the resources, and then they're instantiated in, in different locations and on different resources. So the services that Exceed provides would be supercomputers, visualization analyses, data analysis resources, collections of data, software. And the idea is to create sort of a seamless whole where you're able to transition across multiple resources and you don't really need to be aware of what resource you're using in particular. All of the, all of the pieces need to function together uh, w without any real bumps in the way to get analyses done. So under the TerraGrid, uh, it was never really possible to, to just come in and buy cycles. And the, the allocation process w was slow. We, we, this was a, the, it was viewed as slow. It was, it was slow, and it was paper-based. You got your passwords mailed to you. Um, it, within Exceed, the, the allocation process has, has speeded up quite a bit. It's possible to get an account on the Exceed user portal and get an allocation, at least a, a temporary allocation, fairly quickly. Um, but there's no real good way to, to smooth that out if you, have, uh, if you have needs that go above and beyond what that initial uh, test allocation is for. So IU is working with Penguin to allow the Rockhopper cluster, the Penguin on Demand cluster, to be an, an instantiated set of Exceed resources. And that means packaging up the software um, making the storage accessible, making the visualization resources accessible, so that you can come into Penguin if you're familiar with Exceed, and you can just uh, make use of, of cycles of something that's very Exceed-like without having to go through any of the allocations process. And if you, if, you, know, if you don't have a NSF grant or you don't have, uh, or you don't have, sorry, you need to have an NSF grant in order, to, in order to get into the system and get started using it, with, without having to make the justification to the Exceed Allocations Board that you have a, a requirement for this large allocation. Um, and so we feel that this is a good way to, to deal with sort of bursty demand. Um, a lot of science, science projects may sometimes spend their startup funds and, and buy computer resources, but those computer resources go, go out of date really quickly and they end up being more of a problem than an asset. They need to be managed, they end up showing up in someone's lab and out on the edge of campus, and it, it becomes more of a liability. Uh, the, the Penguin system allows this kind of bursty demand to be, to be really, really smooth because you can buy the cycles, do the analyses, and once you're done, you're done. You don't really need to spend a lot of, of resources on maintaining it or making sure that, that it's, it's up to date, it's cooled, it's not a security risk. All of that is managed for the, for the researchers who require the service. So in this way, it, it really makes things smooth for those who need to get into a project and, and start working with, with their analyses quickly. And it provides an Exceed-like environment that, that, that lets them work with something that they, they may be familiar with already. So the other initiative that's, that's supported by the pod at IU is the National Center for Genome Analysis Support. 
Um, NCGAS is a, is a cyber infrastructure service center that's affiliated with the Pervasive Technology Institute. And the mission is to, to support life science researchers who need computational support for their genomics analyses. Um, it's funded by the National Science Foundation, and it provides uh, a number of resources for genomics analysis. And we've, we've decided to, to include POD as, as one of the possible resources that can support NC gas analyses. Um, the, as, as Barb said, there's a number of software for, for life sciences that's already installed on, on the POD. It's mostly looking, the, the, the particular focus is on De Bruyne graph methods, especially SOAP de novo, Velvet, or Abyss, um, or doing genome analysis via consensus methods, which would be Seller and Nebler or Acne 2. And you can get more information on, on the NC Gas project at its website at ncgas.org. So all in all, IU and, the, and its partners in Exceed and, uh, uh, and, and others are collaborating with Penguin in order to create something that would stretch really above the campus level service. And it provides a lot of what you would expect to find in a cloud service, but without a lot of the drawbacks that Craig was going over earlier of, of, of data security and, and not knowing what's going to happen to the company that, that you're hooking up with. So the service is really a cluster as a service. It's, a, it's an actual high performance supercomputer cluster. It's not like Amazon. Uh, it's not like um, it's not like other services where you simply get hosts that require you to hook them together if you're going to have many of them working uh, in concert. And it's really, really easy to, to get online and, and get working with it. If you're, you know, if you're at an EDU or you're a federally funded research development uh, center, you can just get started really quickly. So um, for, for campus bridging, like I've said, we're working with National Center for Genome Analysis Support. We're working with Exceed to provide this very common, similar environment. Um, and we've, we've done a lot of work with UC Berkeley and the University of Virginia, uh, as well as the University of Michigan. Uh, all, of those, all of those collaborators have provided us with software that makes it very, very easy to ship the data in and out, to do the analyses, and, and get results back to the researchers. And for more information about the pod, you can look us up at podiu.penguin.computing.com or look up the rock hopper system on the Pervasive Technology Institute web pages. Okay? Thanks very much.